Welcome to the Metal Boys. Today on the show, we got Dave Carlo, guitarist from the legendary Canadian band Razor. What's going on, Dave? I'm doing good, thanks. Some exciting news for all Razor fans, or even Thrash fans. Uh, Dave, has a, he sent out a tweet the other day that there's a new album in the works. The music has been done. So Dave, tell us what's going on. And then we can also talk about the band's history later on. Well, the last studio album was 1997, so it's been a while. That's 21 years. Uh, actually, recorded it in May of 1997, so, you know, it's uh, almost 21 years. Uh, this Actually, well, it's May 1st, so there you go. Um, we, uh, you know, I've been doing the writing. I uh, I kind of write the way, uh, you know, like that, that uh, cabin in the woods kind of style. I segregate myself, and I just try to keep distractions out, and I just uh, work on the music first. Following that, I go to the lyrics. Um, so what we did was, uh, the, the uh, tweet I put out on Twitter yesterday was to tell everybody that I finally completed the music portion of the album. Uh, really, really feeling good about that. Just, you know, a wave of uh, relief, maybe a little bit of exhaustion. I've been working <laughs> on it for about five weeks. Oh my uh, God. Really, I haven't been too active on the social media. I haven't been too good with emails. I haven't been too good with communicating with people because of it. Um, I'm going to improve that starting today. But uh, yeah, it's it's been a real, I just kind of put my head down and worked hard to write the album and I got it done. So I feel really relieved and happy and I'm, I'm satisfied with the material. Um, ultimately, you know, it's a, it's a, the public will tell me what their thoughts are on it, but uh, I feel pretty good about the music. So I'm looking forward to getting the uh, the lyrics done, which takes a lot less time. Um, the um, you know, and then I just have to. Uh, the band is now going to start working on on the, these songs. So when I'm assuming you mean music, you mean the guitar, bass, and drums have been done. Completed songs. I have songs. I demo them completely. If you look right behind me, or you can even see, I got my. Uh, I get. I don't know if you can see I, it or not. I can see it. I can see it. My console. Oh, even better. Yes. Uh, you know, I've got computers and everything else here and stuff. Yeah, it's done like, you know, I, I program a, a drum machine to uh, to uh, just get the uh, the music down. We're not using a drum machine on the recording or anything. It's going to be done by the band. But that's how I write the songs. I do the bass. I do everything. I just give them completed songs. No guitar solos, no vocals. Just the music. And now uh, the band will, you know, they've been actually getting the songs as I write them. So I've been sending them over to them uh, for the last uh, five weeks as they're completed. Uh, so they've got, you know, a good head start on the learning curve. And then we're going to get together in the next two weeks and start, um, you know, working as a, as a group to, uh, to get, the, uh, get the music down and get it tight so we can go into the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, lyrics go, like I say, I, I'm guessing it's going to take me about two weeks. I'm not sure if anybody else will write lyrics on this album. I'm probably going to write most of them, if not all of them, just because, truthfully, it's been 21 years. I've got <laughs> one things to say. <laughs> My singer Bob has his other project that he does, Bob Noxious. So that's his vehicle to write lyrics, and he's been doing albums and songs for 21 years. He's had plenty of opportunity to get his points of view across, so it's kind of uh, my turn. And, uh, of course, I have a very talented lyricist uh, in my bass player, Mike Campanolo, too, who wrote a lot of our early lyrics, uh, so he might contribute something for this album, too. So we'll see. What are you looking for in terms of a timeline uh, to the date of completion of the album to maybe a release date? The thing is, you know, it, it is going to be a bit of time yet. Um, where we're at now is uh, the studio is booked for August uh, the reason it's booked for August, we could probably get the band ready much sooner than that. But we have some gigs that we have to get ready for as well. We're going to uh, play a festival down in Los Angeles at the end of June. And we'll need to do a little, uh, you know, diverting from the uh, new material to get ready for that one. And then we have a show we're doing in Finland in uh, early August. So the best period of time for us to get free was uh, after that Finland show. So be probably second week of August, we go in the studio and uh, we'll have it done by the end of the month, at the end of that month. Um, so then, and I have the artwork and everything's already in progress. Uh, so uh, we will be 100% done with everything we need to do by the end of August. And then we'll hand it off to the record company 
and they have to figure out their release timing. The record company is going to be Relapse Records for this release, uh, although there will be some special licenses given to some other companies I've worked with in the past for vinyl, just mm -hmm. because they have been so good to the band, I want them to be involved. Uh, High Roller Records, War on Music, um, a couple of others that will have some limited licenses. But Relapse is doing the worldwide release. They'll do the CD, they'll do some vinyl as well. And they have promised me a very big push on this release. Um, so that's the reason I wanted to do it with them. Um, so they did tell me from a timing standpoint that it could take a little bit of time once I give them the finished product. Now, I don't know as much as I used to 20 years ago about uh, the workings of, you know, pressing and releasing albums and CDs, but they're telling me that they need a fair bit of time to get the vinyl portion of it ready. So, Oh, so there will be vinyl. That's what the big surprise is, huh? Oh, yeah, well, there'll be vinyl. Uh, there'll be vinyl coming from the main label Relapse and also from some sub-labels that are friends of mine that I've worked with. Uh, as I was saying, limited uh, edition, uh, you know, from like High Roller Records in Germany, they'll do some vinyl release uh, because they like to do special releases where they, you know, do colored vinyl and all kinds of cool stuff. So I want them to be involved a little bit. But Relapse is the label, essentially, for this release. And they want some time to put it all together. So I'm not sure how long it's going to take them. I had a conference call with them two weeks ago. Uh, it sounded like they thought they needed about four months. So that's, um, you know, still a bit of a delay after the album's done. So if it's done at the end of August, you're looking at, uh, you're looking at probably Christmas time frame, um, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit after. But it should be out late 2018 or early 2019. It's been about 20 years since your last release. So what's the direction now? I mean, what musical direction are you heading in? Is it same old, same old? Or what is it? What musical direction are you heading in? Well, like the thing is, is that uh, um, the reason we did this album was because over the last couple of years, uh, we've done a lot of shows. There's been a lot of renewed interest and enthusiasm for the band. And so, um, you know, I was able, I've been traveling all over the world with the band performing and listening to people, uh, hearing their excitement about the, the band coming to see us live and talking about how much they'd like some new material. So, you know, I created something that I don't think is going to disappoint anybody. Um, I know which albums are the favorites of the majority of our fans and I know what they're looking for. I wrote this album to please myself first because that's always the way I have to do it because, you know, if I'm still alive 10, 20 years from now, and I listen to it, I need to not want to kick myself about something I didn't do right. So I always please myself first. And if I'm pleased, I hope other people are too. But as far as direction goes, I've listened very carefully to what people have said to me over the last couple of years. And those things were in my mind when I was writing. So I hope that that works out, that they're very happy with what they get. I guess what I'm trying to say is, have you gone into a new direction, maybe stretched out of the box a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 being this far away from the release date, I don't want to, uh, you know, talk too much about anything different or anything. Um, there's uh, mostly what people want, okay? My band is kind of like, um, like what ACDC was in the 70s and the early 80s, not like them style-wise, but like the philosophy, which was um, let's give people what they're looking for, there isn't a lot of, you know, I'm, I mean, there are a lot of bands out there playing a lot of styles. And if you want a certain style of music, you can find a band that suits that taste. Uh, with Razor, people want a certain thing from Razor. And I don't want to put an album that, that they put on and they're just disappointed or they're puzzled or they're surprised. I want them to put it on and I want them to go, hell yeah, right? Like this. So that's what I want to give them. So that's what they're going to be getting. I know a lot of uh, fans ask this question. What about Sheepdog? You know, where is he today? Have you ever tried to have a reunion with him? With all due respect to a Bob Your Singer, right? You know, any any chance of a reunion or do some shows together? Sure. Uh, I talked to him uh, probably about a month and a half ago, uh, maybe a month and a half, two months. We, we didn't talk on the phone. We texted. We were exchanging texts. Um, you know, he did an interview in 2014 with Brave Words, and he said a lot of stuff that was, uh, in my view, uh, stupid, and I told him that very directly to his face, but I also did a counter-article where I uh, 
wanted to set the record straight. I didn't like doing that. I hated talking about uh, behind the scenes stuff. Uh, if there was grievances or anything going on at the band, especially ones that I didn't even know existed. Um, and then I read about them in, in, in print somewhere. And, uh, you know, he said some things that were really uh, false and unfair things uh, regarding, you know, um, my integrity and uh, stuff like that. So I was really pissed off. And um, for a long time, I didn't want to talk to him. And then uh, I finally decided, you know what, I'm not going to hold a grudge here um, with this guy. I just I, I, I'm not going to do that. I don't see anything productive coming from that. So uh, I talked to him. Um, and, uh, you know, we discussed some of those things, but I didn't get into a lot of detail. I just, I don't have interest in getting all negative with people about stuff. I mean, I just want to look at what's going on in the future. You know, I got sick five years ago, or six years ago, actually, I got cancer. That's a life-changing experience for somebody. Uh, it kind of changes how you look at things. You reassess a lot of stuff, how much time you have on this planet, which isn't much. Seems like it is, but it isn't. And, you know, I'm not going to go to my grave um, with any, uh, uh, you know, unresolved issues Absolutely. With people that, are, that, that were important to me in my life. So, uh, you know, we, we talked about stuff. And um, but the thing is, I got to be honest, I was really excited and interested in a reunion uh, about five years ago. But, you know, after that article, I just it was like, uh, I don't know, it just kind of flew away from me. And I just didn't feel like doing it anymore. Yeah. I mean, uh, I like to work with people who who I have, um, you know, like, I'm a blunt, blunt person. I'm very mm -hmm. direct with people, and I, I like people to be honest and direct with me, too. But, um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time for people who are talking behind other people's backs. I'm not, I'm not big on that kind of stuff. So um, I'm, not really, I'm not really looking to do it now. I'm sorry to disappoint people if that's what it does. Um, you know, he's a great singer. He's a really talented guy. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that someday I wouldn't get on the stage with him if, if, if things lined up and that happened, but I wouldn't, I'm not going to work on a project with him, but I certainly will be, um, you know, uh, somebody who I'll talk to him, you know, um, maybe I don't consider him as strong a friend as I did before that article, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to carry around any, any heat with me on that. How did everything fall apart with uh, sheepdog after, uh, violent restitutions? No, if you read, you, you, I think the best way to get the answer is, is you got to go to Brave Words and read the article. No, actually, I read it, and it was like just okay. it well, was so long. I mean, geez, it was a it was a great know, piece, I by know. the way. And I read your retraction did you read, too. Did you read both? Did you read yes. the, what I said? Okay, because I explained that really in great detail. He had one, uh, uh, he had one interpretation of it, and I explained exactly, uh, uh, you know, incident by incident how that how that played out. Um, the truth is, is that, you know, I, and I, I don't want to make, put words in anybody's mouth, but I don't think he remembers very well what was going on in those days. Um, my memory is really good. I have terrible eyesight, but my memory is fantastic. And um, I know exactly how it played out. But the truth is, he never formally quit the band, and I never formally kicked him out. What happened was, was that I got a word from a friend of mine who was Sacrifice's manager, road manager, Ray Wallace. Yeah. Um, he uh, called me in the summer of, 2000, or of 1988, and he told me that Stace was, um, uh, he was uh, working with Infernal Majesty. He was doing some work with them. He was either joining them or he was doing this. I don't know what he was doing, but he was getting busy with them. And... Uh, on that news, I didn't call Stace. I already had a replacement in mind, and the replacement was Bob Reed, because Bob's band had been opening for Razor in early 88. And uh, I formed a friendship with Bob, and I, I really liked his voice. So um, I had already had it in my mind that if I was going to move the band forward and there was any kind of a problem with Stace, that I would get Bob to do it. Because there was issues with Stace in 88 in the sense that he wasn't, putting the work in that he used to. He was forgetting lyrics on stage and he wasn't, he just, he didn't seem as committed to the band as he was uh, in the past. So okay. that gave me the idea that I might have to get somebody else to sing. So that's how it played out. Nobody really, uh, you know, like, I mean, so Stace will tell you, oh, I quit. And yeah. I'll tell you, you know, he never quit. I replaced him. So that's the answer you'll get. And actually, yeah. and, I, and I encourage everybody to go read a Brave Words you know, uh, Sheepdog's sort of statement and as well as your retraction, which was very thorough and, uh, you know, quite in detail. I don't necessarily encourage anybody to read it unless they, uh, you know, if you like the National Enquirer kind of stuff or you like that uh, <laughs> Gary Springer kind of stuff, then, hey, man, read it. But the truth is, is that it's not going to enhance your 
excitement or love of the music. It's just going to tell you some stuff that was going on. And you know what? The truth is, nothing was going on, like, actively. I was never aware of any problems, ever. Nobody, you know, ever. And it seemed like, i got to be honest, I think he only started to get, uh, like, concerned about the band when we did Violent Restitution because he wanted to stay in the direction of custom killing. Yeah. And I think when, when he found out I wasn't going to do that, I think that's when his... Uh, is uh, unhappy to start it. So when you look back at your career, you know, from let's say, you know, Armed and Dangerous, Executioner Song, Evil Invaders, Malicious Intent, and so on, what were the good decisions management made, and what were the bad decisions management made? Because Thrash was, you know, moving up, and so was the band. Okay, good question. Okay, well, first of all, that's a really good question because. <laughs> management is something we did not have we had a record company behind us who had distribution through europe through canada um not not in america so our albums were still only available as imported america we tried to get management and this is one of the things that was brought up by ace where i i, I honestly believe he he wasn't involved enough in the goings-on of the band um, and he just didn't know what was going on there was an effort being made to try and get management the canadian uh, music scene was terrible. When I say scene, I'm talking about not fans. I'm talking about agents, uh, promoters. Infrastructure. Uh, uh, well, see, the problem is is that the Canadian music media and the Canadian music establishment, which is being record companies, management, agents, didn't understand thrash metal. They didn't understand what was happening with bands like Metallica or Slayer. They weren't on the bandwagon, and they were still looking for, you know, the you know, success with bands like Coney Hatch and, and, and that kind of stuff, which is not an insult to those bands, but it's just they had their heads up their ass, and they didn't understand the great potential of this style of music. They just thought it was, like, too over-the-top heavy. It wouldn't have any commercial value, and so they wouldn't take on our band, which was... You know, our mistake, I guess, was to stay in Canada. We we wanted to stay in Canada. We had a Canadian record company. I had an uh, offer from Metal Blade Records uh, at the same time as Attic Records, and I guess I should have took the uh, the Metal Blade offer. But we wanted to make our success in Canada. We, we wanted to stay here. So um, that was probably a mistake. We couldn't get management and support. I think if we had gone to the states, we probably would have found it because other thrash bands were finding it. So yeah, um, yeah. that's that was kind of how I feel about um, you know. So you say what mistakes the management make? Your original question. So the mistakes were made would have been made by ourselves uh, uh, because we didn't have management. And yeah. uh, the only mistake that I would say would be a big mistake Razor made um, was on the third album, Malicious Intent. The style of drumming was changed, and at the time, it was negatively received. It was actually a suggestion by the album's producer um, to drum the way Mike did. He uh, he, he was he was hitting the hi hat as less often than than uh, most thrash drummers were, and uh, the producer thought it made it sound cleaner and faster. Um, but reality was, it didn't sound as powerful. I think so. Um, that was uh, probably a mistake. Uh, other mistake was we should have probably relocated to the U.S. because we would have had a better chance. Yeah, I think to so hook too. Up with, yeah, I, I think so. You know, the thing is with Quebec, though, Quebec is a little bit different because Quebec was more like the European scene, which we loved, by the way. We were so happy uh, about Quebec's uh, uh, love of the band. We spent more time there, played more gigs there, and had a better reception there than anywhere else in the country. Um, so... What I'm, point I would make is a band like Voivod had a little better opportunity um, to spread out a bit just because they were almost more of a part of a European kind of scene. Um, and, and the people in Quebec did seem to understand and get the, uh, the thrash metal thing. So um, I think they were in a little bit better shape. When I look back at the albums, you know, the songs are excellent. But there was always that rough production, right? What do you say to the critics, you know, who uh, question the production? Because let's face facts, if if the production was on par with, let's say, you know, Ride the Lightning or Kill Them All by Metallica, it would have been a different story altogether. So what do you say to those people? I definitely have extremely uh, strong views on that. Um, you know, our budget was was probably not the same as as 
some of the other bands. I know that our budgets were certainly nothing like what Metallica had. I don't know about Kill 'Em All though, um, what their budget was, but I can tell you that Evil Invaders was recorded and mixed in three days. Okay, crazy, so crazy. like, well, that's I mean, people do demos that take a lot longer than that, um, and we had to do that. We had a choice. We could have gone into a shitty studio and uh, you know been there for three or four weeks, um, or we could go into a brilliantly high tech top of the line studio and be there for a few days well we elected that we wanted to be have access to the best quality recording gear and the best recording environment so we went into phase one which is what you know it was used previously by bands like rush and max yeah. webster famous bands successful bands we wanted to work there so we did um but the uh unfortunate uh you know we had to do we had to be quick we had to work fast so couple of things. One is there are mistakes in the playing right on the album that couldn't be corrected because we didn't have time. And the, the mixing process was done in haste. And what I mean by that, of course, is, is that, you know, there wasn't enough time to properly establish the exact sound quality you wanted on every instrument, every sound, or to get the right levels just the way you want them. Um, corners were cut at corners were cut everywhere. And uh, that's that's how it was done. So that's that's my explanation about production. And that goes through research history. Uh, right up to the end of the what you call it, the people call it the classic period, which I guess is uh, open hostility. Everything was done uh, very quickly. Very, you know, um, the longest time we took on any album was probably Custom Killing was about seven days. That was a <laughs> lot of time. That was like a luxury for us. Now this new album, I'm going to take uh, probably about two weeks to record it, not because I'm on any budget constraint. But because I think that's about the amount of time we need to do it just right. We're, you know, I've always believed in having the band 100% ready to go in the studio, really tight, really know our parts, so that you're not going to see many mistakes anyway. And uh, you know, I, I'm guessing about two weeks is going to be plenty of time to do it right. If we need more time, we'll take more time. I mean, that's the luxury of later in life. Uh, the budget isn't as big an issue as it was back back in the day. To everyone who is not a Razor fan or doesn't know the band. You got to check out at least the first five albums. It's just incredible, right? Uh, the classics are the classics, especially like Armed and Dangerous and Executioner's Song and Evil Invaders, Malicious Intent, Custom Killing, Violent Restitution, and of course even Shotgun Justice and op Open Hostility. You know what? Actually, I have one the same thing. I'm just put up in front of me, and so yeah, everybody can see. Good, I'm doing actually the same thing you're doing. Cool. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> by the way, is it, you know what the live album? Yeah, I don't have a live album, but I've heard of the live album. We can send you one of these. This is from 2016. This is called Live Osaka Psycho. Osaka Psycho means, it's a Japanese language, it means Osaka is supreme. Uh, this is our live album that was done there uh, in uh, 2016, was released only in Japan at this point. It's coming out worldwide with relapse. Uh, timing hasn't been worked out yet, but it's going to come out. And um, by all means, check it out. It's available. Um, you should be able to buy it online. Um, I'm not sure exactly where, but believe me, if you just do a, do a <laughs> search Amazon. on Google. Yeah, Amazon should have it. Yeah, yeah, Google, yeah. Uh, I know Rockstack in Japan has it. You can buy it directly from Rockstack. Uh, Rockstack is spelled R-O-C-K-S-T-A-K-K. Rockstack.com. Uh, they have an English language uh, website there. You can buy it right from them. Um, they're the uh, Japanese label that issued, got, they got the uh, opportunity to put it out first. But, uh, you know, it's got, uh, it's got a lot of music on it. It's a full concert, and it's got um, a lot of songs live. Some of the, uh, some of the old songs from the uh, first few albums are on there, too. Like, it's a, it's, a, it's a good album. Check it out. And you know what? A lot of people don't know this, and we've talked about this before. And, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is because, to me, uh, you know, you, you're, you've been faced with so many health challenges. And to overcome all these health challenges, especially playing guitar and writing music, I mean... It's incredible. It's a human story, right? That you, your eyesight, and you know, I, I know you're very open about this. You're not scared to no, talk about this, and no, not at all. And, no. and I think it's it, it's it's great to talk about it because it encourages other people who have these. I don't want to call it a handicap, but you know, a, a tougher time, oh, right? Well, than most. Handicap. I'm okay to call it a handicap. And, and That's I mean, whatever. tell everybody about just quickly, you know, just what you. I mean, here you are. Your eyesight is, you can't see on a straight, I guess, right? You just only see peripheral, right? How does right. that work? Yeah. And, you, you know, you, you you had cancer and you survived and then you had, I, I can't remember all the other problems you had, but you had so many health issues, yet you keep on going, which is very encouraging. And it's 
I think it's, it, you know, you should win like a, some sort of Canadian Oscar for that. I don't know what. <laughs> it's incredible how you keep going. And it's, it's, it's a great story. And anyways, just tell everybody about that for a bit. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. Um, well, in 2017, I was supposed to get the album ready. Like what I just announced yesterday that the album is written now was supposed to be done a year ago. And I had a year full of health issues last year, too. Um, you remember, I think the last time I Skyped with you, my face was half paralyzed. Um, and uh, I had uh, something called Bell's palsy. Uh, actually, I still have a tiny bit of that, but but not not so much that it's it's as noticeable as it was. But uh, yeah, I've been. I've, and then I, I, you know, the last half of the year I had shingles, so I was like really not in good shape in 2017. So that stopped me from getting getting to where I needed to be. But yeah, I, I, I had uh, you know like 2012, I got cancer, and it took, uh, that prevented the band from doing anything for almost two years. You know. Um, you know, you can see the scar on my neck. It's right there, the surgery crazy, scar for crazy, cancer. Crazy. And uh, you know, I'm, it's a little uh, not. I wouldn't say embarrassing because if I didn't have it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be here. But you know, you have to get used to the idea that every picture now, like my, my face is like permanently fat now. Like I, no matter how much weight I lose, uh, my face is going to be swollen here uh, for life. And uh, so I see every picture of me. I go, ah, you know, I'm never impressed with what I see because uh, neither am I. Well, I guess the age is part of it too, right? But you know, having that scar there, and I don't know everybody understands what it is. It just it makes me self conscious all the yeah, time. Yeah, I know. I um, know. So people want to do a picture of me. I'm always trying to turn a little more to this side because it's not as bad over here. But um, you know, so that knocked us, knocked me. And then after that, I was really my energy never, my energy level never returned to what it was before the cancer. It's just never been the same. Um, it was like a sucker punch. And so it's, it's, uh, it took a little bit of time to get back. But what really has gotten me enthusiastic about uh, getting the band going and doing more stuff, not just being sick and getting over that, although that did certainly motivate me, but uh, we added this uh, drummer, Ryder Johnson, in uh, 2014. Um, and you know he's a little bit younger. He's 30 years old, so he's like more than 20 years younger than us. But he's such a uh, fun guy to be around. He's so excited to be in the band. Uh, he's just got a great personality, and he makes going out and performing shows a lot of fun for me. And uh, you know, somebody who I his company I enjoy, and uh, he's just breathed a lot of life into all of us and made it more fun to do. So. Um, you know, and I really wanted to do an album with him because I feel like he deserves to be on one of our albums. Nice. I think he, uh, he earned the right to do that with uh, how much he, uh, you know, he restored a sense of fun to this whole thing. So that's, you know, that's a real important thing. When you have guys in your band whose company you enjoy and you go out and you have fun together, it really is a motivating force. And uh, that's it's probably why I'm not interested in, 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 you know, doing any other types of reunion stuff. Doesn't mean I. It has nothing to do with. I'm not trying to comment about the other guys. I'm just saying this is just such good chemistry with with the four guys that are in the band right now. Positive vibes and quickly. Thirty seconds on your vision. A lot of people don't know this, which to me is like it's incredible. You could even play guitar. Well, I can't see my hand when I'm playing. That's for sure. I have a central vision issue. Uh, the problem, if you want to look it up someday, it's called Stargardt's dystrophy. Stargardt is spelled S-T-A-R-G-A-R-D-T, Stargardt's macular dystrophy. And uh, it started when I was 32, um, just around the time I did decibels. It was not an issue with decibels. I didn't, I still, it started in one eye only, um, but by 2002, it was both eyes. And I just lost all my central vision. And um, you can see pictures on the Internet of what it looks like to have no central vision. It's basically just the like looking directly at anything. You can't see it. There's just nothing there. Um, so all of my eyesight is out of the side of my eyes. Uh, like I'm looking at the iPad right now as I talk to you. I can't see like I can see the uh, border of the iPad slightly, but I can't really see it. I'm just looking in the general direction and hoping that I'm. Yeah. getting it right yeah, so yeah. on the guitar when i when i play live something i have to do i can actually show you i got it right here yeah sure i'm in my okay so on the guitar this is what i'm doing in the, in in for just recording at uh, at home to write the album you can see the that i've got the uh, pieces of tape here they're a fluorescent tape may not show up so well on here but they when i turn the bright lights on in here it's easier for me to use my peripheral to pick up the fret positions and then when i go and play live I uh, bring glow-in-the-dark stickers, and I put glow-in-the-dark stickers on top of it. 
So what happens is, is that uh, even though the lights go out, the, the, the fretboard is still lit up for me so that I can use my peripheral vision to find my way around. So that's, that's how I do it. I got used to that a few years ago. Um, sometimes I still bugger up the guitar solos because, you know, I do most of that stuff on feel. I can't really see what's going on. But, uh, you know, I've, I've become, uh, I've become um, you know, a skilled at it because I've been doing it for so long. Dave, I like to talk about this because you're truly an inspiration. It just says that people who do have these challenges, they can overcome them and they too can either play instrument or do anything they want in life. Very inspirational. Ultimate inspiration. Who's, who's a bigger inspiration than Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath who lost his fingertips and had to make artificial fingertips to play the guitar? And that's Jeff Healy. He Jeff Healy, right? Jeff Healy Jeff, was blind. Oh, well, of course. I mean, Jeff Healy, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no eyesight at all. I mean, that's the, the, these guys are uh, are brilliant, brilliant. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I take my inspiration from those people, too. I, I always, you know, I tell myself, you know, even Stevie Wonder, right? You say to yourself, yes, well, you know, yes. uh, these people... Uh, these people did it. They made it happen. And, uh, you know, so I do. Sometimes I need a little help um, getting onto the stage. I can't see so well in the dark environment. Um, and one of the things I worry about is sometimes that I might step off the stage. So uh, I make sure that when I play live, I have people, uh, you know, there. They put, they put tape down. That's bright tape for me to see in certain strategic areas. So I know that's the... Uh, don't cross that line area, you know. Wow, we take everything for granted, you know, when you can see so well, right? You just you just take things for granted. Oh, yeah, yeah you it, know that. And the thing about my situation is I had my eyesight when I was younger. Yeah. Oh, believe me. I I oh boy, I think about I think about how, how amazing it was to see like that. Things you just took for granted, like grabbing a book and reading it. Yeah. Uh, you know, even using a computer. I don't. I have to use special software to use a computer, right? Like I have to have everything really magnified. Yeah. Uh, you know, my glass. I have a pair of glasses that are like ridiculous. The the lens, the, the the crystal is like so thick, but there. And I have to look this close to to see things, right? Um, you know. And the worst thing is if I drop something. Because if I drop something, I'm screwed, right? Most of the time, I, I have to, you know, I have to get somebody else to help me find it. So, uh, little things like that become really aggravating because uh, because you can't see, and uh, you don't think about those things until you can't see. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you have it. The new album, scheduled to be released, or actually enter the studio in August, and hopefully four months after that, hopefully released, right? Once the work is done, oh, yeah. vinyl. It's definitely going to come out on all formats. Uh, when I see all formats, I know vinyl, uh, it'll be out on uh, CD. It will also be, you know, on Spotify and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you got a show coming up in uh, the end of June, right? With Exciter, Next show is, right? Yeah, Exciter? Los yep, Strike right. Fest in Los Angeles with Exciter. Yep. So there you go. So uh, Razor, catch him on tour. Uh, hope, looking forward to the new album. Can't wait. And uh, yeah, pick up their old stuff. Pick up uh, the live album. Pick up all, I know it's been pick repackaged. All the older albums have been repackaged. I have them. Actually, I showed them before. Here we are. I'll show them one more time again. I know you can't see, but here, boom, boom, boom. There it is. All repackaged. Pick them up. Worth the money. It's friggin'. Here. Something else to show you. All right, here. something else. Let's go. Really quick here. Get one of these, too. Pick up one of these buttons. Nice. Be, not. These just uh, came out. They're uh, available. Um, they're called Rockin' Pins, rockinpins.com. Love it. How about your T-shirts? Any merch on T-shirts there? Um, we got a T-shirt deal coming with Shadow Kingdom. A ton of T-shirts are coming out very soon, like within weeks. And I will put that up on my Twitter. So have a look and keep your eyes open. We've got a whole bunch of Razor stuff going on. Uh, next 12 months is going to be very exciting. A lot of stuff happening. Great. All right, Dave. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks we'll talk for talking, soon, man. Thanks for your interest. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you again. Okay.